Sailors, go, no, go for landing. Retro. Go. Rhino. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Econ. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Altitude 4200. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. In previous videos, we've already leapt way past the moon to discuss terraforming planets, colonizing other solar systems, and building artificial worlds. We sort of skipped the moon because I tend to think of it as having been covered a lot elsewhere, but in truth, nobody really goes into much detail about what we do with the moon after getting a base there. Generally, it's get there, set up a base, use base for getting to Mars somehow, and mine it somehow. We don't tend to see much actual discussion of this base and what it does or how it advanced to the general purpose of getting out into space or moves forward itself. I thought today we'd delve into that matter a bit more and explore some of the options and ideas. Before we go any further, if this is the first video on the channel you've seen, then there's two features you should be aware of. First, since I have a speech impediment, the videos always include a transcript and closed caption subtitles you can turn on. Some people have a harder time understanding me, and that's not even including all the arcane technical jargon these videos often have to include. Second, for the sake of brevity, I occasionally reference other videos on this channel, or other ones where our concept got discussed in more detail rather than repeating myself, and if you see a thumbnail or video clip pop up in a yellow or white link box, you can click on that and we'll just pause this video and open that one in a new window so you can watch that and return here where you left off. Okay, so people often wonder why we haven't gone back to the moon since the 70s. We did it six times successfully in a few years, nearly half a century ago, and neither United States nor anyone else has gone there since then, at least with people. In the meantime, we have vastly improved a lot of the relevant technology, especially computers and robotics, which is actually part of the reason. Our rockets are better, our quality controls are better, and we can make vastly lighter or superior equipment to what we had in the late 60s. Fact of the matter is the US could easily do another series of moon landings, and Congress is hardly afraid to cough up the cash for that since taxpayers would mostly not object to the expense. The European Union, Russia, China, Japan, or frankly just about any G20 nation has the necessary technology and infrastructure to do it. So why hasn't anyone? Of course, some people doubt we ever went there in the first place, that it was all fake. And in these modern days of Photoshop and CGI, it's hard to dissuade them. I've occasionally heard people suggest you could see the Apollo landing sites through a telescope, but that's not true. Even the Hubble telescope lacks the resolution to view the moon. And even if it did, I wouldn't think that we would convince anyone since someone could mess with the video feed. We can resolve human-sized objects on Earth from space, but the moon is about a thousand times further away from us than those satellites are. You can't see any man-made objects on the moon through any telescope we have now, let alone one available commercially. So a lot of people subscribe to the moon hoax theory, I think mostly because they just can't imagine why we haven't gone back since, and no one else has either. But the simple reality is that as things currently stand, there's not much real benefit to gain from doing so. Getting some more moon rocks or drilling some samples would certainly be nice, but it's not a particularly urgent project at that cost. Uh, there's a lot of other science of higher priority that can be done cheaper, and if we did do it, we'd end up using robots, which would defeat the purpose. We want to stick people on the moon again. And collecting samples is honestly just an excuse to do that. So when someone inevitably points out a robot can do it cheaper and better, we end up sending neither man nor machine because we don't really need more moon rocks. I would suspect that, given a long enough time, even without any more technological improvements, someone will get around to going there again. But for it to be more than an exercise of national inspiration, you have to have some real purpose in going there with people, not robots. A part of the reason manned missions to Mars are so appealing besides being a step forward rather than a repetition of past glory, is that the time lag to Mars is many minutes, as opposed to the moon, which is only a couple seconds. So robots can be controlled more or less real time on the moon, A no thinking human brain actually needs to be on the moon overseeing the affair or doing the work. To push forward with the moon, we need a genuinely valid reason to want to not just send people to the moon, actual people, not robots, we need a reason to justify a permanent presence there. So, let's consider what the moon has that the Earth doesn't. And unfortunately, it's not a terribly long list. First, it lacks two things which the Earth does have. An atmosphere, 
and a gravity well. Gravity is a real downside to space travel, and the moon has much less of that, and the same is true of atmospheres. What it does have that Earth lacks is helium-3. There's just not that much on Earth, truth be told there's not that much on the moon either, but it looks like there's way more than we have here. This relative abundance of helium-3 has sparked a lot of talk about mining the moon for it, to be used in nuclear fusion. Uh, there was a great film, especially considering its low budget, called Moon, back in 2009, in which such an operation was going on, and of course there have been tons of articles in various pop sci publications in recent years. Problem being, we don't have any nuclear fusion reactors to use it for fuel in. We discussed the impact of nuclear fusion last year, and it's huge. Just a few kilograms of fusion fuel would produce around a billion kilowatt hours of juice, a hundred million bucks worth of power. And yeah, it's expensive to get to the moon and back, but not that expensive, especially if you're setting up shop and just shooting the cargo back. Moon return trips are relatively cheap since there isn't much aerogravity to keep you from getting off the moon, and there's plenty of gravity to help you get back to Earth and air to slow you down on the entry. So helium-3 mining is definitely a good reason to go back to the moon and stay there. You'd only need to return 10 or 20 tons of material a year to run the US power grid. Again though, we don't have a fusion reactor. And none of our main efforts to get fusion actually use helium-3. They use deuterium and tritium, two hydrogen isotopes. Because one of the hard parts about fusion is overcoming the Coulomb barrier, the repulsive force between two positively charged atomic nuclei. Simply put, helium-3 consists of two protons and a neutron, whereas tritium is one proton and two neutrons, and deuterium is one proton and neutron. Pushing a pair of protons together is hard, like repels like, and helium-3 has twice as many protons as deuterium and tritium, so it's much harder. In basic terms, the temperature you need to pull off inside your reactor is about ten times hotter if you want to use helium-3. Now, a helium-3 and deuterium reaction is a great power source, but again, it's a much harder one to pull off than deuterium and tritium, and both of those are relatively abundant on Earth, and fusion is fusion. You get any working fusion reactor, and you totally change the world. The advantage of helium-3 compared to them is mostly that it's an aneutronic type of fusion, and that has a lot of potential advantages, especially for making a compact reactor that didn't take up whole city blocks, and might conceivably fit into a spaceship that didn't dwarf an aircraft carrier. I mentioned in that video on fusion that as great as fusion would be, it isn't necessarily usable directly for spaceships, since the size and power output per mass of reactor is very important for that application. We discussed a lot of alternatives for launch if you have a lot of power but it's bulky, like mass drivers and launch loops, but helium-3 reactions and aneutronic fusion reactors hold a better promise of being able to actually cram a fusion reactor into a spaceship as a useful power source than deuterium tritium reactions do. But even then, you also don't necessarily need the moon as a helium-3 source for spaceships leaving Earth. We focus on deuterium tritium because it's far easier as a reaction than anything else to produce. But your ideal fusion reactor, besides one that runs on straight vanilla hydrogen, is deuterium-deuterium reactors because deuterium is very plentiful on Earth and all over the universe. Deuterium-deuterium requires a higher temperature than deuterium-tritium, but not as much as helium-3, and a deuterium reactor produces tritium and helium-3 as its byproducts. If you want helium-3, you can just extract it from the reactor, and for that matter, any leftover tritium will decay into helium-3 too. That's where we get our supply of helium-3. We use tritium to boost fusion bomb yields, and with a half-life of only a dozen years, we have to suck out helium-3 and replace it with new tritium. Though I should note that helium-3, even if you can't use it for fusion fuel, is still useful stuff. Helium-3 is used for quite a few applications. These days it costs several thousand dollars a gram, hundreds of times more than gold. So at current market prices, a ton of it shipped home from the moon would fetch several billion dollars. Of course, you'd expect the price to drop sharply if quantities were to soar, and the US supply is only about 8 kilograms a year. Sort of like how we talk about asteroids with tons of platinum on them being worth several trillion bucks to stoke up asteroid mining interest, the basic economics of scarcity would suggest the value would drop to a fraction before you could sell it all. So while I don't want to say the volume of helium-3 on the moon is overhyped, it's not really likely we'd ever be mining it from the moon to ship home, 
it's also, again, not that abundant. It's not like there are puddles of helium-3 lying around on the moon to be sucked up and shipped home. Concentrations in general would be about 1 to 10 parts per billion on the moon, to maybe as high as 50 parts per billion in areas which are in constant shadow. So if you want to come up with the 10 or 20 tons a year that would take to run the U.S. power grid, you need to be ready to plow through at least a billion tons of lunar regolith a year. But it has some real possibilities as interplanetary spaceship fuel, meaning the moon could easily serve as the oil well of the early and mid-stage interplanetary travel. There is way better source of it deep out in the solar system. That's not the only way the moon could be of assistance though, just a recently popular one. We are looking for an excuse to set up shop on the moon permanently and in a big way, with large bases hosting dozens if not thousands of personnel. Helium-3, even if we develop a reactor that can use it, probably isn't that excuse unless for some reason that works out to be the only commercially viable fusion reactor, which doesn't seem likely though there are some serious advantages to aneutronic reactors that might make it so. Still, it probably won't be, so what are the other reasons? Again, because of the lack of air and gravity, it's a good place to serve as a base. It's much easier to mine the moon, and in some ways easier to power yourself on solar power than it is on Earth. Low gravity makes for much easier mining and much easier off-world transport. Lunar regolith is very abundant in oxygen, silicon, iron, calcium, aluminum, and magnesium in that order. We wouldn't ever mine those resources for Earth itself. Earth has plenty of those. But it's useful for building space stations and spaceships. And if the infrastructure is in place, the Moon is a much better source of raw materials than Earth for stuff off Earth, since you don't have to lift the stuff through miles of air and much stronger gravity. Solar power is also a pretty decent option for the Moon because it actually gets more light than Earth, as our atmosphere absorbs and deflects a lot of what arrives from the Sun. Also, solar power is often problematic on Earth because it goes away every day, and clouds in the sky can make it very dim. No clouds on the moon, and the day is a month long. The moon's circumference is just under 7,000 miles, and its day is just under a month, so even at the equator where the day-night tornado moves fastest, it still only moves a little under 10 miles an hour. On Earth, very fast planes can outrun the sunset. On the moon, a fast jockey could and there's no air resistance for vehicles and low gravity, so if you are mining on the moon, you could conceivably use solar-powered robotic vehicles that just circumnavigate the planet once a month under perpetual sunlight, and return to their base once a month for maintenance. We generally tend to think of moon bases as being nuclear-powered, and that's certainly an option, or solar-powered but running on batteries or fuel cells during that half-month of darkness, but without air resistance and with low gravity, rolling bases are a possible option. What's more, it isn't difficult to build tall towers on the moon. There's no wind, and gravity is again very low. And the higher you are, the more light you get per lunar day because the horizon isn't blocking your light. There are places in the polar regions like Shackleton Crater that have spots that get sunlight 80 or 90 percent of the time. Since the poles are going to come up a lot in any discussion of moon bases, let me explain that a bit more. We all know about the midnight sun and how places near our own poles here on Earth have months of perpetual darkness or sunshine. We also mention polar bases on the moon a lot and places where the sun shines longer. There are places on the poles of the moon where we expect to find more ice, the poles are colder, and ice is good because we need water. There are places on the poles that get light longer, or darkness longer, than near the equator as well. This isn't for quite the same reason as it is on Earth. On Earth, Earth's axial tilt relative to the Sun means the higher latitudes are constantly facing the Sun for months at a time, or faced away from the Sun for months at a time. The Moon, on the other hand, has very little tilt relative to the Sun. This isn't the cause of the places with long light or dark phases. There is a concept called the peak of eternal light, where a spot on a rotating object around a star might be lit all the time, or nearly all the time not to be confused with tidally locked planets like we discussed some months back. On those, the sun shines on one half of the planet all the time, and never on the other side. As we also discussed then, there is no dark side of the moon, because the moon is tidally locked to Earth, not the sun. One moon day and one moon year are the same length, one Earth month long. But there are places on the moon where the sun shines 80% or 90% of the time. And the cause isn't axial tilt or orbital patterns, it's that the Moon is much smaller than the Earth, 
with a much nearer horizon, and that there's no winds or tides eroding all the craters on the moon. A mile-high mountain on the moon juts out more than one on Earth, and the higher you are, the longer your day. Here on Earth, if you climb to the top of a very tall building or hill or mountain, and your friend stands down on the ground next to you, you can see the horizon farther off than he can. So you can see the sun rise before he does, you see the sunset after he does, your daylight period lasts longer. We'll take this simple globe and add a peak. Watch as the day-night terminator sweeps around and hits the high point first, and then as it sets how the high point remains illuminated longer. The higher the peak, the further it is to the horizon in each direction. This is more pronounced on the moon because the moon's diameter is considerably smaller than the Earth's, so a mile-high object sticks out more. Similarly, if you were in a valley, the sun would rise later and set sooner. If you were on a mountain peak that had two large valleys to the east and west, located where your horizon would be if it was flat there instead, the sun will rise even earlier and set even later. Same concept. If you're in a valley with a mountain to the east and west, the sun rises way later and sets way sooner. So if you're in a deep crater on the moon with large crater walls, you won't see much light, even less than on the Earth since there's no atmosphere scattering reflecting light from other directions. This effect gets even more pronounced near the poles because the planet's diameter, at least in terms of the distance from the axis of rotation, is even smaller, and that's what it actually is blocking the light. Watch as these identical mountains at the same longitude but different latitudes have the day-night tornado run over them. See how the sunlight leaves the one near the equator first? So we often have an interest in polar bases on the moon because they've got spots in them that get sunlight much longer, and often very close to places that get shadow much longer. Places on the pores which are under almost constant shadow are way better spots to find ice. It's also where you'd expect to find more helium-3 for that matter. So a polar base located in a large crater is a nice base location since you've got some of the optimal places to put solar panels that can run most of the time, right nearby where you'll have dark spots where you'd expect to find more water ice. Also again, because gravity is so weak and there's no wind, you can build incredibly tall but flimsy towers that further extend your daylight, with solar panels or even just mirrors on top of them. You still need batteries or fuel cells, but for a much shorter period of time. You could also get around this light issue by using power satellites that beam their energy down to a base. Satellites consisting of basically just a reflective parabolic dish and some attitude controllers constructed on site would be fairly easy to launch, as we'll discuss in a bit, and you could keep an area pretty well lit perpetually, or send it down as a power laser or maser to some receiver. For that matter, the moon isn't that big, and it's desolate, so you could just outright run power cords along the surface, or build a few solar towers that beam energy to other towers not in the sun. Towers can get very tall on the moon because there's just no wind, and weaker gravity puts less compression on the materials. But that's also not the only way to build a very tall tower. You can rely on tensile strength instead, uh, if it's tall enough. That's the basic concept of a space elevator. As we discussed in the Megastructures video on space elevators, while we don't have any material strong enough that we can mass produce to make a space elevator here on Earth, we do have an option for the Moon. A lunar space elevator is a bit of an oddball because it has to be longer than an Earth space elevator. It can only point in two directions to be stable since the Earth perturbs lunar orbits much more than the Moon disturbs Earth's orbits. The first stable one would point right back at Earth and the second directly away from Earth, but that's fine. The one pointing at Earth needs to be 35,000 miles long, and the one pointing away from Earth would need to be just over 40,000 miles long, to their respective docking ports, as opposed to a space elevator on Earth which would be just 22,000 miles long. This is because the Moon, while it has weaker gravity, also spins much slower. The one on Mars is much shorter because its day is about the same as Earth's own, but its gravity is a lot weaker. But the moon's gravity is so weak that you don't need any ultra hard materials to build it from. Same as you can build towers on the moon very tall without much wind or gravity to impede you, we can build a space elevator on the moon much more easily than on Earth, which makes it even better for mining uh, to fuel space industries in the general area of Earth. But every space elevator needs a counterweight on the end of it. We usually picture this as some asteroid towed in for that purpose, or some very large docking facility. 
On the moon, that could be a bunch of meals in whole apart. And not only are the tops of space elevators virtually always in the sun, but even for the short time one lunar elevator wouldn't be, the one on the other side of the moon would be, and you could just bounce that light down to a base from the mirrors or beam it down as power. You could target anywhere on the same hemisphere, so with just two elevators, you could illuminate any place on the moon. So lunar space elevators are a pretty neat idea, and the added power and light advantage makes them even more appealing, but ground-based solar and batteries or fuel cells, or just having a nuclear power plant, is probably more practical. Also, while elevators are far easier to build on the moon, they aren't nearly as handy as they would be on Earth. We discussed mass drivers, space cannons, and launch loops a while back, and the big issue using those on Earth to launch vehicles is that you have to make a very long track to get up to the necessary speed to escape Earth, while having a low enough acceleration not to crush human passengers. This is made much more impractical because you've got to keep the tunnel evacuated of air and get the muzzle of the space cannon out over the atmosphere. That's not even an issue on the moon. There's no air. And the escape velocity of the moon is just over a fifth of what it is on Earth. Meaning you only need about 4 or 5% of the energy and your track can be much, much shorter and you don't need to elevate the end of the cannon over the atmosphere because there isn't one. To get up to Earth's escape velocity at just one gravity acceleration, requires almost 20 minutes of acceleration down a 4,000 mile long track, Indian towers many times higher than our tallest skyscrapers, and the whole thing has to be a sturdy vacuum sealed tunnel. To get up to the moon's escape velocity at 1 g of acceleration wouldn't require even 200 miles of track, and it could be just track, like a normal railroad. Even though building giant towers on the moon is way easier than Earth, you don't need them. There is no air to flood your tunnel or cause drag or lift. Also, track length drops proportional to acceleration, so if you don't mind subjecting people to, say, 4 Gs of acceleration for just over a minute, your track only needs to be 50 miles long. And if you're just shooting raw materials or fairly sturdy manufactured items up, you can get away with 100 Gs easy and have the track take just 2 miles. Truth be told, raw materials like iron could be shot out at 10,000 Gs or more easily. That's the acceleration inside a rifle, and that would only need to be 100 feet long. So we might not build a lunar space elevator, even though we could, just because using space cans is so practical and way easier to shield from micrometeors and solar radiation, which are serious issues on the moon. You could launch stuff directly to Mars from there. You'd still need rocket fuel, but way less of it, and you could refine fuel on the moon. As noted earlier, Lunar regolith contains huge quantities of oxygen, aluminum, and magnesium. Liquid oxygen burned with aluminum or magnesium is a pretty decent rocket fuel, and monopellant gel of aluminum powder and liquid oxygen appears to be very promising too. We talked in the terraforming video about baking oxygen from rocks, but in some way form, you could make from locally available materials whole acres of solar ovens and stills for creating this fuel which could be used to help power a moon base during dark phases as well. Ships could leave the moon for places like Mars or asteroids via a mass driver boost and fully fuel it up to speed up more and then to slow down. Or you could ship that fuel elsewhere. Truth be told, once the infrastructure is in place, it might make more sense to ship fuel from the moon to Earth orbiting space stations with fueling ships that left Earth orbit than to ship up more fuel from Earth itself. It would really depend on how easy such fuel refineries were to build and maintain. And with the progress we've been making in robotics and 3D printing, that might be very easy indeed. We do want to put people on the moon, but robots are almost certainly going to play a huge role regardless, especially in early construction phases. Things would be a lot easier and safer, not to mention cheaper, if your initial moon base is constructed before the astronauts arrive by drones. Which brings us to our next point. The classic moon base tends to show up with a lot of glass domes, but this isn't really a good idea. People don't particularly need direct sunlight, particularly raw sunlight that hasn't had the nastier stuff filtered out of it by our magnetosphere and atmosphere, and our plants wouldn't do great under that light either. Glass is a poor protection for micrometeors too, so you wouldn't be building your structures above ground, or if you did, you come by and plow over them with dirt afterwards. 
A couple feet of lunar regolith between you and space is an ample shield against anything you really need to worry about. And because of the lower gravity, the structure doesn't need to be too sturdy to handle that weight on top of it. If you need to get light in, you can have glass walls and have your roof extend well over it, then just have mirrors bounce the light in. Those can be made to not reflect harmful frequencies rather easily, and mirrors don't have to be made of material that shadows when it gets hit. So even your food crops wouldn't be exposed to the open sky, and your actual habitation areas would probably be as deep underground as you could comfortably get away with. I've also mentioned before, in both the terraforming video and the rotating habitats video, that while we can fake gravity with rotating structures in zero gravity, you can do this in lower gravity too. You have to combine the natural gravity with the spin gravity so that inside that structure, your perceived down is at a diagonal. There's no air outside for drag, so it won't take much energy to keep such things spinning. This keeps your moon men from suffering the ill effects of lower gravity, which is very detrimental to the body over long periods of time. Now again, everything is easier if you've got working fusion, which you would obviously have if you were mining the moon for helium-3, but setting up shop on the moon without fusion is definitely doable. It hasn't been done thus far because it's very expensive and doesn't serve much point. It's also the sort of thing where you need to go all in. A small moon base manned by a dozen people like some polar resource station isn't the way to go, even if virtually everything is being run by robots. The moon is not Mars. Signal lag time is only a couple seconds. So even maintenance on robots could be conducted by other robots controlled mostly real time from Earth. You don't need a moon base for a Mars landing. But if you're hoping to truck thousands of colonists to Mars and have routine traffic and supplies going back and forth, it makes that way easier to have the moon either directly in that loop or sending fuel to stops in that journey. And if you want to do anything serious on Mars, you do need to send people. The time lag is just way too high for practical remote control. So any serious operation on Mars or any other location deeper out benefits from having a lunar base feeding in fuel and material to the travel loop. You don't need people on the moon to do anything if you've got good enough robots. And I mean mechanically good enough, not smart enough. You can control the entire operation from Earth. But if you want people there, you need a decent number because you're setting up a community. You're growing food, cooking food, building habitats, repairing your robots, conducting experiments, and so on. McMurdo in Antarctica is probably your better example. Even in the winters, there's about 250 people there and a few times that in the summers. We mentioned Dunbar's number, around 150 or 160 people, during the interstellar colonization video, and as a quick reminder, that's generally considered a good size for a community. You could get away with less than that, though, since it is only a couple of seconds to the moon, so while chatting on the phone with your relatives would be a bit laggy, taking 4 or 5 seconds for you to hear their reply to, good morning, how are you, it still takes a lot of the psychological pressures off people in terms of those we encounter from remote outposts with small numbers. There are going to be things where that signal lag is too much, like performing surgery on someone who was injured, and there's a lot of types of maintenance that at best would be a major hassle due with a robot drone and a 4 second delay. Of course, if you got people up there, you need to feed them. So you also have to grow all your own food. It costs tens of thousands of dollars in fuel to ship just one day's worth of rations into low orbit, and the moon is much more expensive, so keeping 100 people fed on the moon perpetually would be running you billions of dollars. Plus, the vegetation can help recycle your air and water and waste. This raises the sunlight issue again, because the day lasts a month on the moon, meaning that except near the poles, you've got to cope with two weeks of darkness. Even if your plants could handle two weeks of darkness, they aren't scrubbing carbon dioxide out of the air while you're doing that. The two weeks of constant light is no big deal. If you're pumping your light in via mirrors or fiber optics, you just block that or tilt it away as necessary. Many plants do fine, even better, under longer light cycles, though others do not, and many use it to trigger flowering, so light control is a big deal, if manageable. Darkness is another issue. You can get around that at some spots on the poles. Plants can handle a few days of low or no light, by and large, and you could run some lights off batteries or fuel cells, or even rocket fuel if you're mass producing that during the light periods. Truth be told, you'd probably be wanting to run those backup lights during the day a lot too, when power is abundant. 
since you can boost plant growth by pumping up the wavelengths of light that are used for photosynthesis, and that lets you use less meals, and you can build your farm a bit more vertically then. Which is doubly handy if you want to have higher gravity in your farms than the moon's actually got. Another nice thing about the moon is that with those long dark phases, low gravity, and no air, it is a pretty handy place to build telescopes, especially the new liquid meal telescopes, which could be made obscenely large. The basic concept of a liquid meal is like our combined natural and spin gravity. When you spin a liquid on Earth, it forms a parabola from the mixture of gravity and centrifugal force, a natural parabolic dish you can shape by adjusting the spin rates of the device. We use Mercury on Earth for this, which isn't ideal for the Moon, but we've also been having some good progress with a class of organic compounds known as ionic salts that should function that role on the Moon and actually look like it might be cheaper to build these on the Moon than here on Earth and there's no air or light pollution making it even better as a location. There's one last object that can be built on the moon, and can arguably only be built on the so-called dark side of our moon, and that's a giant laser. We talked about using lasers for pushing ships to very high speeds, and you probably also are familiar with the idea of using lasers to blow up or divert asteroids that might threaten Earth. The problem with big lasers is they are big weapons, and the dark side of the moon is called that because it never faces the Earth. If there's one place in the solar system you could feel fairly safe about building a giant laser that couldn't be used as a death ray against our own cities, that's the spot. Also, when dealing with doomsday weapons, if you actually run the numbers on the kind of energy the things use, unless you've got some kind of special sci-fi unobtainium to get rid of the heat, the entire thing ought to melt. You can only get rid of heat by radiation in space, so if you build it into an object like the moon, you not only get all that rock to use as armor to protect critical components, but you can also shunt all that heat into the moon by convection and conduction instead. That way you don't have uh, big thermal exhaust ports your rebellious sun can shoot torpedoes down and blow up your massively expensive doomsday device. The picture that gets painted here, though, is that a return trip to the moon really doesn't serve much point, unless you plan to set up permanent shop there, and in a fairly big way. And we're unlikely to want to do that until we're ready to seriously push out into the solar system in which case the moon has the potential to be an invaluable resource. We're not ready yet. And it can be kind of depressing to think that it's been almost half a century since we last set foot on it. But keep in mind that while Antarctica was first explored in the early 1800s, the first expeditions to get to the South Pole took place decades later in the early 1900s, and it was 1911 before a Mundinson's team got to the South Pole, nearly beating the ill-fated Terra Nova expedition led by Robert Scott that arrived a month later in January of 1912. It was 45 years before anyone returned, and the U.S. Navy flew in and established the Amundsen Scott Station there, about the same time as it's been since the last moon landings and the production of this video. Even then, this facility wasn't a major installation until more recent times, being completely rebuilt in the mid-1970s. Now, just over a century after those first two expeditions to reach the pole, is a thriving and productive resource facility manned by a few dozen in the winters and 150 in the summer, and is one of many such facilities in the Antarctic and Arctic. Good things take time, and just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Our base on the South Pole is robust now because it's useful, it's vital for astrophysical and particle research. Whether a moon base comes about because helium-3 becomes valuable as a fusion fuel, or because we want to use the moon to get raw materials and fuel for projects around Earth or deeper in space, or as a lifeline to Mars and other planets and asteroids, or to build truly enormous telescopes on, or just from sheer human drive and human stubbornness to do it, or some combination of all of those, it will happen eventually. So on that note, we'll close out for today. If you enjoyed this video, please like and share it, and subscribe to the channel. And feel free to try out some of the other videos on the channel. As always, questions and comments are welcome below. I try to apply to as many as I can, and I'm always looking for new video ideas. This video itself came from a request just a few days back when I was having a bit of a creative writer's block, for instance. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.